We'll call the Health, Safety, and Sanitation meeting to order. And tonight what we have on the agenda is just an update from Police, Fire, and Sanitation Department. Uh, Chief Walters from the Fire Department is not going to be able to be with us tonight, so Mayor Hamill will take over his <laughs> duties. Uh, I think this, this uh, time we're going to start out with Nina. We'll, we'll give you the first first choice here, Nino. If we could each go about 10 minutes, that'd be great. That won't be long, so. Very good, thank you, Mr. Chair. So in the sanitation department, uh, we're unique. We still pick up trash, the uh, old style, a lot of physical labor, as you well know. Um, thanks to council last year, we went from nine MEOs to the approved uh, 12 MEOs, which helped. So we traded the uh, six part-timers for the three MEOs, the additional, and that's been working out well. So we have enough guys with CDLs, so far, it's been going well. So getting into uh, 2022, um, we disposed of uh, sanitation material in Medina County, Wayne County, and Portage County, um, the three different areas. The majority of the refuse went to the CPF here in Medina City. I'm sorry, in uh, Seville, the CPF. Um, we collected and disposed of residential, commercial, industrial solid waste in the amount of 24,737 tons. So 24,700 tons went to the CPF. Um, the rate went from 52 to $53 in 2022. That bill for the city was $1,321,368 just for the CPF. Um, that's, that's a lot. We currently have 7,570 residential customers and approximately 1,114 commercial customers. Um, so the tonnage, traditionally, if you recall our conversations, is split residential and um, commercial. So it's about half and half, 50-50. So um, last year in 2022, the residential tons were 11,861. The previous year, they were 12,300. So we saw a reduction of 4% on the residential side. Likewise, on the commercial side, um, there, was, there were um, 7,137 tons. Um, in 2022, and then the roll-offs were 5,831. So those combined were the 12,000 equals the, the 24, obviously. So we saw um, a decrease about 5.5% with respect to the commercial side. Um, the tip fees this year are $55 per ton. They went up $2. Um, they do keep increasing. Um, we're anticipating a dollar per uh, year increase. Um, when we go to the policy waste committee meetings, they talk about, the board talks about, it has to be presented to the uh, commissioners, and then they vote on it. Well, if, once it's presented, it, it happens anyway. The only reduction we had is in 2014 when they reduced um, for a short period of time. So with our recycling programs, um, the city, we have a, a cardboard commercial program that we pick up no cost to the res to the commercial uh, customers, and we picked up about 275 tons. Um, mm -hmm. That is delivered to the CPF at no cost, so we're allowed to dump that for free. Now, we don't track that. I don't know who the end buyer is, but it was 275 tons that didn't go to the landfill, and it helps. So then we also have a food waste diversion program, mostly with uh, Sandridge. They do a really good job on organic recycling because there's a big um, interest to um, land diversion, landfill diversion with our industrial customers. So we work with them and in 2022, we hauled, well, the, the guys in the field hauled 1,187 tons of organic waste and that went to Liverpool Township, um, respectively also to Portage County. When I said we take um, items to and material to Portage County, there's a Congress Lake Farms and they end up making um, feed uh, feed ration for cattle. So there was some of that that went there and then also to Worcester to the anaerobic digester. Um, in 2021, it was about 2,287 tons. So we saw a decrease of 18% from 2022 to 2021 with the uh, food waste. Um, as you well know, we have a, a really good um, yard waste program. We started in 2017. Um, the guys are really proud of that. That has grown exponentially um, last year in 22. 2022, we picked up 335 tons. Um, the unfortunate part of that is we pay $23 a ton now in the recent years for um, disposal. That goes to CPF. Originally, for the first three years, 
2017 through 2020, there was no charge for disposal. Now I think folks are catching on, so we're paying $23 a ton at the current rate to, um, to dispose of that material. So when you take those three lists from the yard waste to 335 tons, the cardboard and the food waste, that comes out to 2,549 tons. That's without the leaves. So you look at that percentage, that's about 9.25% of our inbound collections that would be going to landfill that um, the city sanitation department uh, diverts and actually gets recycled. Um, so it's not a great number, but it's moving in the right direction is something that we know for a fact, because we pick it up, we handle it. And if you add the leaves, which is picked up by the street department, that's another 1,231 tons. Um, that comes out to 3,780 tons, and that takes our recycling rate to 13.3. Um, I'm not gonna sit here and bash the, the county scorecard, but they're at uh, like less than 5%. And we talk about curbside uh, recycling and subscription. And if you, if you look at our numbers, like Brunswick uh, has a um, curbside subscription, curbside recycling, we surpass their averages with what we're doing without having curbside, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. without the plastic pickup. So um, we're moving in the right direction. Again, as, as we reiterate, we, um, we recycle what we can. What we know is gonna get recycled and the end product will end up going somewhere and, and coming to a good use. Um, there has to be a market. The caveat is the, for recycling to work, there has to be an end buyer and we're not seeing the end buyer with the plastics. I mean, you folks read and you hear um, it's just not there. Um, we do have regular conversations. Um, the mayor and I met with uh, uh, one of the commissioners and then the new coordinator for um, the solid waste district. And then we had a decent conversation, but we, we were honest in telling them that we're just not seeing what uh, other folks are seeing at this point in time. Um, maybe someday it'll get there. Um, moving forward here, we're looking at um, the purchase of the new truck, which council just authorized, it's a 13 cubic yard um, rear loader. Um, we're hopeful that that's where the trend is going. It's half the size of our regular hopper trucks. Um, it, it benefits the city in multiple ways. We're looking at fuel consumption will be less. We're hopeful that maintenance will be less. It's easier on the streets because it's not as heavy. Um, it doesn't require a CDL to be driven. That rule changed in uh, 2022 in February. Um, where we, I think we talked about it in numerous meetings. Um, so that seems to be where the trend is. We'll see how that plays out um, once we have the vehicle for a while um, and go from there. But we're hopeful, we're hopeful that we can um, look at some other um, options for recycling. Um, I talked to Jansen about a tub grinder. A tub grinder would be used where we have our own, um, our product, our yard waste and the, and the leaves and things of that nature. But that requires a, uh, a composting um, type four license, which is through the EPA and it's very burdensome, um, very cumbersome to operate and just to manage. Um, so we're not quite there yet. We're looking at other options. Um, I am talking to, uh, um, it'd be a vendor in Summit County. We're having some discussion that maybe it'll take the yard waste product, but we're not paying. So we have to evaluate, you know, the $23 per ton that we're paying to dump the 335 yards or ton currently versus fuel, labor. It's, it's just on the other side of the, of the Summit County line, so it's not far. Um, but those are the things we need to evaluate um, before we would pull the trigger on something like that. So we're always looking at ways to cut costs, be more efficient. Um, as you know, the sanitation department does a great job. We have great supervisors, we have a great staff, and we're fortunate. Um, you know, public is very happy with the work there. that, um, you know, the service they're receiving. Um, so that's pretty much it in a nutshell. And if you have questions or- Thank you, Mina. Any Absolutely. other members have uh, questions? Bill? Yeah, um, just two things. The, the yard waste tons were 335, is that- was Correct. That, was that right? It is. Um, and, and secondly, just if you look at those things that you just, just explained to us about the the cardboard, the food waste, the yard waste, and then the leaves. Mm -hmm. That's an incredible, that, that's an amazing, you know, if you, the way it's put together, it's an incredible uh, number of uh, the weight that we pull, you're, you're pulling out of the, that we're paying for, other than the fact that we are paying for some, we're paying for some of the yard waste. Correct. And um, I don't know if the whole, if the community 
at large is aware of the effort that you put into really stitching together all these different components because most people simply see either the garbage truck come and pick up everything in their tree yeah. lawn or they see the dumpsters where they can go ahead and dump their own recycling. But that's really an incredible multi-part system to reduce the amount of waste that's going into the landfill. You know, and I, I wish there was a way that we could get that, that message out, I guess, further to people in town to just know how comprehensive the, pro the program is. So I appreciate what you're doing. And always hear good things. Uh, you know, we always hear good things. I'm, I'm sure you guys can, can confirm this. Right. About the, the sanitation department, the sanitation department workers, the pickup on the tree lawn. You know, it's just, it's just a wonderful thing to be a part of. Appreciate what you, everybody in your department is doing. Well, thank, thank you for you. that, Bill. Yep. Thank you for that. And, uh, and you're right, maybe you should talk about it. I should present it more in the uh, council meetings in a report, but try not to overwhelm the, uh, the reports. But we should just maybe put that out there more. I know it's on the website. I know it's in the year-end report, but it's not represented together in the totals like I just talked about. Maybe we could do that. Yeah, thank you. Yes, sir. Reggie? No, I'm, I'm impressed, Nino. Thanks. Nino, uh, again, you know how how we all feel about your your department and and the work they do and and the respect they have from ninety nine point nine percent of the community that that they serve. So I would give it that ninety one hundred percent. But there's always going to be one person out there. That's, but thank you again for all the hard work. Thank you as well. I'll pass it along. Thanks, Chief Kinney. Thank you. I'll run through this here so we don't run into. Uh finance and the mayor will have an opportunity to give yeah. the fire department's report as well. The, the uh, past year, 2022, we bounced back a little bit from the COVID decline in activity. We were up a little over a, a thousand calls for service from 2021. Um, some of the other notable increases that we had over the, uh, the prior year is arrests. Our arrests are up significantly. From 2021, we were at 468 arrests in 21 and at 668 arrests in 2022. An unfortunate trend that we've been seeing is an increase in domestic violence activity that's by far uh, responsible for the, the vast amount of arrests that we make. Uh, domestic violence continues to be a problem in the city. Uh, to highlight that, in 2021, we had 150 domestic violence related calls in 2022. We had 246 domestic violence related calls. So that's uh, an unfortunate trend that continues on over the, uh, the years. Uh, we continue to struggle with hiring as does every police department in the state. Uh, we developed a lateral entry program. Civil service worked with us uh, along with the, the law department. Of course, council approved the program ultimately, but that will assist us in giving us the ability to hire officers who are coming from other departments that are tenured certified officers and uh, they have a, a substantial amount of experience. We have recently hired uh, two officers who, who do have prior experience, so we're looking forward to getting them out on the road and uh, ready to go. Currently, we're working to fill four positions. We have a conditional offer for one officer, so that leaves us with three more positions that we need to fill. We just finished a civil service test, so we're hoping for some good candidates off of uh, that test. Um, we continue to struggle attracting candidates to come and take our civil service tests. We're still doing better than most departments in the county when it comes to turnout for tests. However, I still consider it significantly lower than the amount, uh, for example, when I got hired, we had over 300 people that took the test. I'm sure the mayor can attest to that as well when he was testing that it wasn't uncommon for the bigger cities to have thousands uh, and now we're getting 20 25 and uh, consider that a pretty good turnout when compared to everyone else in the county so we're we're working through that as well we also have one vacancy in dispatch that we're looking to fill we just completed that testing process and we're in the process of interviewing candidates and our dispatch center they're still busy as ever we're working on getting all the dispatchers trained in emergency medical dispatch certification. And we're working with the vendor on that to get the uh, computerized version of that as well to assist those dispatchers in working on the, the calls that come in. 
We're also working towards receiving our own 911 calls. That, that was just recently approved through the 911 Planning Commission at the county level. We're now at the, uh, the technical advisory committee level working on getting the cell towers redirected to the individual PSAPs. So that would be to Brunswick, Medina, Wadsworth, and the Sheriff's Office. So essentially, the towers that are here within the city of Medina will be assigned to come straight to our dispatch. Currently, all calls, all cellular calls in the county go to the Sheriff's Office first. The call is screened, and then it is sent to our dispatch, or Wadsworth or Brunswick, depending on the, the jurisdiction that the, the call is in. And then the call is screened a second time. So unfortunately, the callers are having to give the nature of the emergency and their location twice which you can imagine is pretty frustrating to callers during an emergency. Mm -hmm. So we're working to streamline that process and uh, save seconds, because sometimes seconds matter. We're also exploring the uh, radio console upgrade. It's, it's taking a while. We're, we're kind of in a flux between the state mark system and the county Harris system. There's been some changes where there's the potential where the state may be providing the mark system for free to us. So we're trying to just ensure that we're making the right call on that upgrade and that it'll work on both systems and it's it's just the right equipment that we will be using. Our current equipment is end of life, so it, it necessitates that that upgrade, that change. Um, furthermore, this year in the next, next council meeting or two, we're gonna be submitting a request for council action to add one additional dispatcher we have not added a dispatcher since 2010. The townships have grown substantially around us in activity, in size, and in personnel. Uh, Montville Police Department has doubled in size. Medina Township has added additional officers, um, and we've also taken on Lafayette Township. So that increase in activity has, has necessitated the increase in staffing and dispatch. So we will be bringing that request forward here in the next month or two. Uh, as I mentioned, we, we did take over Lafayette Township several years ago. This past year, we entered into another five-year contract with Lafayette Township where they will pay us $400,000 per year, again, for the next five years for uh, law enforcement services in the township. Here in the police department, we're continuing to invest in the drone, prob drone program as well. We're adding additional officers so that they're able to fly the drones. We're finding that uh, the drones are very beneficial to the officers when they're out in the field and they can deploy it immediately when it comes to looking for people who flee from us. Uh, we've looked for water breaks for the water department and we regularly assist the fire department in structure fires being able to, to point out where hot spots or areas that are getting hot in a structure that the fire department can't see with the naked eye. <clears throat> we are also developing and investing in a peer counseling program. It's a county-wide program with an emphasis on mental health and wellness. Our detective bureau is also invested in cell phone and computer forensics capabilities. This is software that allows us to examine cell phones. As you can imagine, almost every single crime that we have has some type of nexus to typically a cell phone, but they also have the capabilities to, to uh, examine computers as well. One of the financial implications that, that we foresee in the, the police department is fuel. I know you guys were gracious enough to give us an extra appropriation for fuel last year because of the high costs. We're hoping that that happens again this year. I think I probably speak for Nino as well, that he's hoping for that. <laughs> Um, as far as training, we're continuing to invest in training for the officers as well as the dispatchers. Uh, we have an emphasis on health and wellness. In April, we are all attending a Dr. Gilmore uh, training seminar, and it's going to be at a church outside of the city here. And that individual is a... Uh, so a, a well-known speaker throughout the country, and he discusses health and wellness for law enforcement officers. I will also continue our active shooter training. This year we'll be training in Claggett School. It's uh, extremely realistic training for our officers in the event that there's an active shooter, whether it be in a school or, or any highly populated facility or building. Uh, it's, it's not specific to schools, but 
that training is beneficial for factories and, and again, any building that has a high concentration of people. And of course, our crisis intervention training, uh, as officers are hired, they come in, we send them to the crisis intervention training. Uh, every single officer goes through this training. It's an integral part and a partnership of our de-escalation techniques and our de-escalation policies. Uh, this allows us the tools to be able to, uh, to deal with people who are currently in crisis and uh, at, at times not thinking clearly. Uh, this, this training gives the officers the ability to de-escalate those individuals and it, it really offers safety and protection to the individual who's in crisis as well as the police officers. So that's, uh, that's a summary of the police department. I'm happy to answer any questions you may have. Bill, questions? Um, no, I mean, you can't be much more comprehensive. It's a great, you know, the packet that you gave us is terrific. Yeah, it's great. Appreciate you. all you said. And you've got a much better packet than Nino has. I'm not sure why, why <laughs> you have this great colorful packet. And I noticed that. And I'm glad you pointed it out. Yeah. <laughs> Excuse me. Reggie? I guess I just have a comment. Um, it's sad to see the increase in the number of arrests over the last couple years, uh, especially in domestic violence, and I realize there's a lot of reasons for that. Um, but in my spare time at home, I like to watch a lot of documentaries, and the ones that are very interesting are the ones that I call uh, uh, related to social issues mm -hmm. and so I'm very much aware of, of what's going on um, out there um, and how bad it can be for some cities. Having said that, I do feel safe here in Medina. Um, when I talk to outsiders, I let them know that this is a safe community. Um, I, I never feel afraid to go out walking in the evening or any time in any, any location within our city. So uh, basically what I'm saying is you guys do a great job. Thank you. I appreciate that. And the, the, the men and women of this department are really invested in the community and they're the ones that deserve the accolades for that. They do a great job. Chief Kenny, thank you so much for the updates and you know how we all feel about the police department. And, and, uh, Kudos to you and your staff. Okay, last but not least, thank acting you. fire chief, <laughs> <laughs> Mayor Hanwell. Yeah, thanks, Denny. And uh, Chief Walters apologizes. He uh, was not feeling well and didn't didn't feel it it appropriate, nor did I, for him to come in and expose anybody. Um, so he he did provide me with with uh, some of the information, and and I modified just a few things. So uh, probably of most significance is the uh, recent approval of council to bid for the new uh, self-contained breathing apparatus uh, to replace our current inventory that's 17 years old and it's experiencing uh, failures day to day. Uh, it is out to bid now uh, because council assists us in getting it passed so quickly. Uh, that bid closes on Friday, March 3rd, so this Friday. Um, once we then evaluate those bids um, and determine uh, the best bidder, that'll be awarded through uh, Board of Control and delivery is expected um, af after the decision is made to take another eight to 10 weeks. So we're doing everything we can to keep that moving. The uh, next topic is the um, staffing. We started the 16-hour staffing on weekends in October of 2022, and it's working out very well. Uh, we had five new hires uh, earlier in the year to help make this possible. The current staffing hours are 8 a.m. Uh, to midnight, seven day, <coughs> excuse me, seven days a week. Now, the overnight uh, hours are then handled by paging and calling out staff as needed. Um, the reason that, that we staff the hours that we do versus the overnight hours are that as we look at, at the um, call histories uh, for fires, they're lower during those overnight times as compared to the other 16 hours. And there, there are also uh, many more people available to come out on a call out 
during those overnight hours. So it's kind of a dual benefit. And I would also mention that uh, there's a duty officer on call anytime we don't have the, uh, the uh, station staffed. Um, and what we use that duty officer for, even on a call out, is to get there first to assess the scene and, and then help coordinate what, what response is, is best so we don't, we don't waste sending things that aren't needed or not enough things that are needed. Um, the Explorer program, I asked the chief to give me some information on that. And um, we have 10 current participants. Uh, the program is, is active and the membership is good. And they just set up a new area at Station 2 that was not being used to help better organize the group and have a, have a place to meet. And for those, those that may not be aware, uh, this is kind of like a branch of the uh, scouting and it's for uh, young folks with an interest in either police or fire service. There's one for police too, um, but they're too young to get in. So it kind of gives them some exposure. They can help out with PR things. Uh, they, they can get some experience and then make a determination uh, whether they want to get into law enforcement, into fire, uh, into a dispatch position. So we see it as a, as a good way to help channelize um, some new recruits uh, for future hires. The Station 1 parking lot replacement using uh, ARPA funds is going to begin this spring or early summer. And as you can imagine, we're going to have to do that in phases because we still have to be able to uh, adequately get the apparatus in and out uh, along that construction period. So we'll, we'll make sure to plan and, and secure that so that we get it all done, but, but it doesn't um, adversely impact uh, response from that station. And, and the last that I'm, I'm uh, not that I'm not proud of the others, but I'm most proud of is um, I asked Chief Walters to take a look at the uh, Ohio Fire Executive classes, uh, and they start in May. And this is a uh, two and a half year program uh, four fire chiefs focusing on executive leadership and planning. And uh, to my knowledge, we had never done that. Uh, at the police side, we would send folks to the FBI Academy for, for upper level leadership like that. Uh, but we had not, to my knowledge, with fire. So it's a two and a half year program. Uh, he will attend a week long session each spring and fall at the Ohio Fire Academy in Reynoldsburg. And then throughout the periods in between, uh, there's a lot of project work and papers and things that go back and forth uh, through, that, through that whole program. And um, we're, we're very proud of the work uh, of our firefighters. Some of them have, have been with us for, for many, many years. And um, soon, sooner or later when they retire, we're, we're trying to find folks to take their places. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. <clears throat> Bill? Any questions? No, I'm good. Reggie? Thanks. No, thank you. Uh, same thank thing, you. you know, we're all proud of the, the work those, those uh, firefighters do on a daily basis, and uh, we're, we're fortunate to have that caliber protecting our city and Medina and Montville Township. Uh, I did fail to ask Jim or John, do you have any questions for the three gentlemen? Nope. Not, Nothing else to come before this board. I, I, I thank you for your input and, and the knowledge that you shared with our community and this meeting's adjourned.